the life of Christ. And the way that we have um, this whole way that we have in the life of Christ, we celebrate our brothers and sisters in Christ. How many people celebrate birthdays in their family? Birthdays. Celebrate birthdays. Absolutely, okay? Why do we celebrate birthdays? It's because we're giving thanks for that person. What? Sorry? We're giving thanks, giving for, thanks that for that person, person in our life. Right, yeah. they're important to us. We right. celebrate the day they were born. Well, in the Catholic Church, we actually celebrate, for most saints, we celebrate, what is their, what is their birthday? Do anyone know what they usually celebrate? Their death. Their death. Why would we celebrate their death? Their new life into eternity. That's the new life into eternity. That's where they, they brought the race to the last two who would won. In our second reading we talked about today, we talked about what sport was he talking about? Right. Running. Running the race for what reason? To win. To, to win, to get to heaven. And he re received a what? A crown that will not wither or will not fade, okay? So the aspect that we are we are running a race, but we're not doing this alone. We are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses. Talking about home, like home field advantage. Anyone know of any games last night that had a home field advantage? <laughs> Chicago Cubs. All right, Chicago. Okay, why, why would the home why would the home team advantage? Why, what does that give? What does that give an advantage for? Why would you have a home team advantage? What is it? You got all your supporters. You got all your supporters yeah. there. Okay, we have all your supporters. Okay, so in the Catholic Church, we have all of our saints that celebrate with us that are right there, winning, running the race with us. Um, before we get into the calendar, I want you all to turn to Hebrews 12 in your in your Bibles. We're going to read one through five. Hebrews 12, one through five. Give you a little bit of time. It's in the it's in the New Testament, and it is right after basically. If you go in the it's on if you're looking at this um, at this Bible, it's thirteen seventy two. And it's right at the beginning. Would you mind reading it? Sure. Yes. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. For the sake of joy that I lay before him, and he endured the cross, despising its shame, and it has taken his seat at the right, at the right of the throne of God. Consider how he has endured such opposition from sinners in order that you may not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You have also forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons. My, my son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Excellent. All right, so that cloud of witnesses, who is that? It says here we are at the very beginning. Since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us ourselves of every burden and sin cling to us that cling to us. The cloud of witnesses is saints. the saints in heaven. They're active and alive in our lives right now. And that's what's so amazing about our faith. You know, we ask one another to pray for us. And why would we ask someone to pray for us? What's the purpose of asking? Why I said, Marie, could you please pray for me? Is there value in her praying for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because her work, not, not the, because God in his family, he wants us to participate in each other's lives. A good father is shown forth in the way he's, a, the way he's fathers his children, right? It's not just about me and Jesus. Our relationship with Jesus is so important. But he wants, as a good father, he wants us to participate in each other's lives. And that's why we ask the saints to pray for us. Because they are up there praising God in time. I would like for you now to turn to the book of Revelations. This is where we get a glimpse of what's going on in heaven. We're going to turn to the book of Revelations. We're going to turn to chapter 5. And that's the last book of the Bible should be easy to find. If you are in, um, in the book that we have here, it's four, uh, 1408 and uh, 1407 it begins. And um, that book over there with Scott Hahn, The Lamb's Supper, he goes into the book of Revelation and talks about how the mass is actually a vision, is actually a mass is pattern of the worship that's going on in heaven. There we go back there. Thank you for my, being my <laughs> vanna back there. The Lamb Supper there. So the, the background in Revelation, I, had, I wish I had my icon. I went through my garage today because we still have just moved and we're trying to find all of our things and I need to find my icon of, of um, having, when I went to, I had a chance to go to Greece and went to the island of Patmos, which is actually where John wrote the book of Revelation. 
And when he, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, which means he couldn't go participate in the heavenly lit the liturgy on earth, okay, with, with all of his other brothers and sisters in his faith. He was exiled there to be alone on this island. And I went there, and there's a church on that spot, and I got an icon of him having his revelation. So here he is, John, on the island of Patmos in the middle of, the middle of Greece, which, you know, actually isn't so bad to be on. It was really beautiful. <laughs> if I'm going to be exiled anywhere, I hope it's in the island of Greece. Um, but he was there, and it says at the beginning of the book of Revelation, this is his vision where he is participating in the heavenly liturgy. He's participating in mass in heaven. And um, as we go through and we start to kind of glimpse, if we look at chapter 4, it talks about here, um, this is on page 1407, God the Lamb in heaven. So it's kind of giving us this background. And I'm going to show, I want you to think about the visual images of what's happening in heaven. Um, and, um, and give you a little background. I'll kind of unpack it a little bit more. But basically we'll see who's surrounding, who's in heaven, and what are they doing in heaven. So starting with 5, 6. Would you like to read that? Sure. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw standing in the midst of the throne the four living creatures and the elders a lamb that seemed to have been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes. These are the seven spirits of God sent out into the world. He came and received the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. When he took it, the four living creatures and the twenty elders fell down before the lamb. Each of the elders held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are prayers of the holy ones. They sang a new hymn. Worthy are you to receive the scroll and to break open its seals, for you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue, people and nation. You made them a kingdom, of, you made them a kingdom and priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. Okay, so right back, if we go back up here, so you have this image of these four, four creatures. Anyone know who those four creatures may be? They're saints. Well, what four things do we have in, in the scripture? We talk about them, we read them every Sunday. One, one, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, um, and John. So those are, four, those are the four creatures they oftentimes refer to as there. So you have this, both, we have those saints up in heaven. And then we have um, basically a scroll hand on. This is kind of like in the Mass when we read from the scriptures. And he says here, when he took the four living creatures and the 24 elders, fell down the, at the, with the lamb, each of the elders held a harp and a gold bowl filled with incense, which are what? What is, what is symbolized by the incense? Which are the prayers of the holy ones. So the incense is kind of, when we ask our, our, our brothers and sisters in heaven to pray for us, it's like they're offering incense. What does incense do? It rises, okay? So if you've ever, if you've ever been incense, you, if you've ever been to Catholic Church, you'll probably find incense being used. And it's a visual symbol, but also a bodily symbol. The church is beautiful because we use our whole selves to worship, not just our minds or just our hearts. We use our whole bodies. So in the way that they're offering incense, <coughs> our brothers and sisters in heaven, are in the, they're in the presence of God. And because he's an awesome father, he wants us to offer our own prayers through their intercession because that's how our father works. I know my dad is glorified, but my older, my older, my younger sister kind of helped me become the woman I'm meant to be. That's how his, that's how my dad's fatherhood is, is lived off. And all of our, our, the way that God's glory is shown is the way that we all commune with one another and offer prayers and sacrifice for each other. And that's the, really what the Elizabeth of the Year is about. It's about living the life of Christ. And... Um, I'm going to share with you some fun ways of doing that, and also some artwork, and then we'll get more into the liturgical year. But if we look at the liturgical year right now, we are in, if we look at here, we're in the green area here, and we are now in November, and we are at, what week, do anyone know what week we were, we were, um, we were in? The, the 30th week, okay? How many weeks do you think there are in the liturgical year? Does anyone know? Any Catholics know? <laughs> 34, okay, almost the same number of Christ living for 34 right. weeks. Yeah. And, on, and then at the last, the last one of the liturgical year, there's a special feast day. Does anyone know what it is? The Feast of Christ the King. That's the final one that we have in the celebration there. Um, going back a little bit, being in the time of ordinary time, and yesterday being the, uh, the feast day of St. John Paul II, I wanted to share with you a, a particular piece that I had my students make of him. It's a sculptural piece, and I'll pass it around. And actually... This was, um, we took these pictures um, 
on our All Saints Day last year, we got to dress like saints, and I'm dressed in a Native American outfit. Does anyone know who I was? I was I'm Blessed Kateri, who is actually my, my patroness. When I was a child, my parents said that I used to talk to this, this, this young, young friend of mine. Her name was Kateri. They had no idea where I came up with that name. And apparently I, I discussed with her and would tell her all about my life, and I would just have the conversation with her. My parents had no idea. When we moved from Indiana to upstate New York, and I got my, my first communion at, at um, Sacred Heart Parish in, um, in, Wilming, or in uh, Lake George, I went outside right after my communion and started playing around the statue. My mom's like, come here, Alice, I want to get you in pictures. And I wouldn't leave this statue. And my mom went around and looked at it. It was a little statue of a young woman dressed in an Indian, Indian um, in garb. And underneath it was, at that time, Blessed Kateri Takwitha. And she became my confirmation saint because I'd had this relationship with her early on. And each and every one of you will, will kind of figure out who the saint is who really speaks to your heart, or she was somebody who spoke to my heart. And in this other picture, we have Sirvan, who is dressed like a soldier, a young woman soldier. And you want to take a guess who she was or Saint is? Joan Saint Joan of Arc. So the two of us are kind of here um, interceding with John Paul II because it's a sculpture here. And I'll pass my, my phone around. But I want to kind of share a little bit about the story about this, this sculpture being done for John Paul II. I, had, um, I knew that he was coming close to death. This is in the year, it was two, 2004, fall semester. And so I had my students do this project where I gave them a grid of John Paul II and I gave them a piece of clay, like a, a slab of clay. And they had to, they had different levels on it as far as one level, two level, kind of look like a topographic map. And they were supposed to, without knowing what the picture was, carve away and their square would fit with all the rest of the squares, kind of like we are in the church, to be able to make this overall picture. And the first time I fired it, I hadn't had a lot of experience with, with clay, and um, like almost 12 of them blew up. They didn't make it through the kiln because the way they had layered them was actually adding um, kind of holes. It, they actually created air bubbles in the process, and I didn't know better because I was thinking how, how to have them make it. The next time I tried it again, and all of them except for two of them blew up. No, no, all, of them, all of them survived except for two. And it was one of those things where trying to get high school students to do a project a third time is really difficult, <laughs> let alone the first time. So I waited until the second semester, which was spring, and I asked the two who had done the pieces that had blown up to come back in and the rest of them to kind of help me put the whole sculpture together. And it was actually the day that he died that we got together. And we were, we were grouting it, and the, the last pieces survived. The last pieces that had to be put together were the, the throat, like his last breath, and his blessing hand. And they finally survived. And um, on the Saturday was the day that I ended up putting those two pieces in. And I was listening to the radio. And he had just passed away as I put in his healing breath, his, his last breath and his healing hand. And it was kind of like we all go through this aspect of it's almost like a firing, trial by, trial by fire. And John Paul II did the same thing in his life. He lived in a crucible of sorts. His own, he, he lived his life-giving love in his life in the way he lived it. And yesterday is the day that we end up celebrating that. And I actually got a, um, I posted a, a, something on Facebook about praying for him, having him pray for us. And I got a text from one of my former students who's really struggling with faith. And he, he said something that was kind of like, he sent me a message saying, hmm, I'm really struggling with this. Oh, he didn't say that. He kind of like started lambashing the Pope. And I, I was like, okay, I'm not going to respond. I'm going to respond in a positive way. I said, I can sense that you're really struggling. He goes, yes, I am. I said, well, know that you're in my prayers, and I'm really praying for you through this struggling process. And he just, his whole demeanor and his conversation with me changed. He said, thank you so much. And he's, I said, I know you're struggling, I know you're going through a, a trial right now, but don't lose faith, and know that I'm praying for you. And he would have been one of the part of the class. He didn't help with that project, but it was that particular time when we were making that particular project. And I was like, okay, Lord, we're called to be in communion with each other and to pray for our brothers and sisters, but also to ask for their intercession. So I asked John Paul II to pray for this particular student um, because we all need to have that intercession there. And that's kind of the beauty of, the, of our saints. And on this wall over here, I have some of my favorite saints as well. And on your tables, we have certain saints as well. So over here, and I've gotten these, these from various stories of my own journey in my own life. And I'm going to start with the tables first. Anyone, can anyone pick up the, the little statue over here? And say, does it say anything on there that might clue you into where, where it was? Medjugorje. It's actually an image from Medjugorje. And actually, I was, on, uh, I was on a pilgrimage there. It's an image of Our Lady with, um, with a ch church um, underneath there. And it's just basically the aspect of reminding me 
of Our Lady's intercession and the holiness of, of our experience with kind of participating on a pilgrimage that I went there. So that's that table over there. And I think the table over here, I actually just have you, um, so we have, we have one over there. Can you can I show, show what yeah, it says? It's, uh, Saint Francesco. Saint Francesco. Who's Saint Francesco? Saint Francis. Saint Francis. Actually, that was given to me on um, my celebration, actually, the first time you came to my house. <laughs> when I, I was celebrating my grad school, um, that I was uh, kind of graduating from grad school, and our priest um, at the time had brought that over to be able to, as a blessing to me. And so we keep it on our little mantle right now, but the St. Francis being somebody we also look to for prayers. Um, and over here we have another statue right there. Who's the statue of? Does it, can you tell who it is? The Holy Family, okay. That was actually, anyone want to guess where I got that from? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, I did. I took a pilgrimage to Bethlehem, and that's made from olive wood. So symbolically, what, what, what was, what's the symbolism of olive wood? The cross, and also the olive, when Christ went to be tempted, where did he go? The, the Garden of Olives. And so the fact they made that there, and it's almost like, if you look, can I see this? I'm just kind of like showing you the design. It, it's actually almost like, what does it kind of look like? A tree. It looks like a tree. It's also cycling up, almost like, almost like a cloud, kind of going up, up to the top, like a Shekinah glory cloud, which is in the Old Testament. So it's almost like a, a, or, or even a flame, kind of going around there. But the Holy Family being a family that we need to look to to be able to find witness in their own life, and um, as as we have our families there. So we have that over there, and then I think on this table right here, over here, we have we have some other journey pieces that I've gotten um, back back there. What, so I know someone thought that they were um, <laughs> that they're orange orange, but they're these cute little designs, and it is a what, what's that called? A nativity. I got that actually from my students who's from Mexico. They brought me this as a gift, and they're just really beautiful little tiny tiny pieces, and we bring that out as one of our manger scenes. Um, during our um, Advent time, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little while. And then here we have an, um, anyone want to guess what that is? It's a candle with what? The Sacred Heart of Jesus. Actually, we were, we were married on the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so we got double candles for my sister in our room, bedroom and the night <laughs> we got married. So we had a Sacred Heart of Jesus on, my, on, on his stand and a Immaculate Heart of Mary on my stand. So to kind of like have those candles and light the candles is kind of a liturgical celebration of, um, of um, when we pray in our bedroom, which is just beautiful. And then did I miss anybody? I think we have. Ah, over there. Oh, you guys are going to be my example there. Actually, would each one of you hold up one of those? <laughs> we, we left. We, we, three people. <laughs> all right. So we have over there uh, a living advent. A living advent. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. So having our Advent wreath out, and we always bring it at a, uh, we bring it out at Advent time, which we will have um, coming up pretty soon. And what's a beautiful tradition that we have in our own family is we end up um, lighting one of the candles for for or not one of the candles, but we light the candle for, at dinner so that we actually eat by candlelight. So there's usually, usually only one candle at the first week of Advent, and then we have two we eat by two candles and then three candles and then four candles. Right, and that's following the scene. Obviously, for for those familiar with, it's following the sequence for Advent. And we're going to go into a little bit more, but the idea behind this, and we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about Advent particularly in just a moment, is that Advent is a season of hope, right? The, the liturgical seasons are, are times when they're, they're feasts when we, when we focus on the, the uh, 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 or devotion to a particular saint or the witness of his life, but then we have these colored areas on the calendar, right? And one of those is Advent, and those have specific things. There's, there's a virtue we're looking for, hope. Why? Because... Christ is coming into the world, right, at Christmas. And then, and then the virtue will be joy. So what does lighting this wreath have to do with that, right? So these, these things that we call sacramentals, they're just little reminders, are ways that we participate in physically and prayerfully in the life of the church. So we sit down at dinner, and it's just a reminder of where we are, what we're doing, and why. And for one week, we eat by the light of one candle, right? And then the second week, we eat by the light of two candles, right? So the light's growing. The third week, you can actually see your food. We have three candles. <laughs> and, and it's the pink candle. You light the pink candle on the third week, and it start, we have this growing sense of Christmas is coming, right? Expectation and hope. And that hope is building up and starting to spill over into joy. And the last week, we have four candles, and we're like the album of the chipmunks. Hurry, Christmas, hurry fast. You know? and, uh, and, then, and then Christmas comes, we're in a new season. 
But this is part of the point to why we have these, what we want to call these, uh, these religious items in our house. What they really are, in, 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 in more than one way, are reminders, little holy reminders in our lives, right? And, uh, and, and, to, and also reminders of, you know, where we are and, and what we're doing, but also reminders to turn our mind to God. And that's the point to all of this, right? As it said in one of the readings that we read, right, that all of these saints were focused on Christ. And then all redemption comes through Christ. So all of these, any devotion to a saint, right, uh, because we admire the witness of his life, uh, any time we're asking for intercession, and any time we're using some sort of an object, the object is only a symbol. It is only a pointer, right? that raises our minds to heaven. And the same thing with the liturgical calendar that we'll get back into in a moment. I think Allison has some more show and tell. Sure, well, actually we could do it in, in the context of um, the liturgical calendar here. Okay. That's a great way to talk about that. So right now we're in that green section there, which is about the ordinary time of the church. Um, and then we're going to have the Feast of Christ the King, which is actually a solemnity. And um, does anyone know what color you usually wear on a solemnity? Usually one of two colors. A solemnity. Maybe we don't even know what a solemnity is. is. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. You know, then actually, um, and within the life of the church, we have we have like big parties. Like for example, think about anniversaries. Like you may have your one year anniversary, but you also have your like your your fiftieth anniversary. Those are huge. Those are like taking the anniversary and celebrating a little bit larger than life. So you may have like a silver anniversary or a gold anniversary, or fortieth so, birthday, or fortieth birthday, <laughs> or, <laughs> or other other things. So you have certain times in your life. Where you kind of boost it up a little bit, you kind of put on a little more party clothes. <laughs> you have those areas where you just take it up a notch. Within the church, we have every day. There's there's either an ordinary day or there's a feast day associated with that, depending on which saint is um, is that day. And um, certain saints or certain days have a, a greater degree of solemnity. And I first really understood this when I when I joined the convent, and I'm trying to apply it now that we're married because we really live the liturgical year. Um, on, on little on small on sisters who had feast days in the house, we would have special meals. On uh, but and if it was a, a feast day that was what's called a we basically have um, normal burial days, normal days. You have memorials, you have other um, you have memorials, you have uh, feast days and then solemnities. I think there's some other things in between. There's optional memorials, there's memorials, there's feast days, and then and there's also solemnities. Solemnity is the highest. Yes. So explain your personal feast day. Okay, so your personal feast, for example, my feast was the Feast of the Visitation. Um, I, Elizabeth, was my name was Sister Annalise. And so the Feast of the Visitation is when Elise, Elizabeth, or um, Mary got up and she went to visit um, uh, Elizabeth. And that's who was the mother, who was the mother the of John the Baptist. And, um, and so that was my special feast day. And that's kind of like the day that I celebrated um, to be able to have that kind of um, personal celebration. We no longer celebrate birthdays <laughs> after we were postulants. So basically, ever since the sound of music, Mm -hmm. like, that's kind of like where I was <laughs> as far as that. She was, she was a postulant. In a Dominican in a, in a, in a, I was in Dominican convent. She was a postulant, and so she wasn't actually officially a sister. And then um, after I received the habit, which I still hadn't taken vows, um, I then had a feast day, which was, uh, which was, um, th uh, which was May, 20, May 31st. Anyway, so with these different types of days, you celebrate with different amounts of solemnity or with different amounts of joy. So, for example, for Christmas... All, we have what's called an octave, which are eight days of Christmas. So you have all of Advent to kind of prepare, and you have Advent is a little bit more, there's a little aspect of penance with Advent and also preparation. <clears throat> so in the sense of during, Lent, during Advent um, at the Dominican house, we, we probably, we wouldn't, we wouldn't speak at any meals. We would just kind of have silence, meditative uh, conversation, or not talk, but um, somebody would read. But when it came to solemnities, which was Christmas, uh, we would wait till midnight and then the young sisters would go and we would sing um, Christmas carols to wake up the older sisters. And then we'd come down to have midnight mass at, um, the, at Christmas. And then we'd have a big celebration afterwards. And then we talked at every meal <laughs> for the next eight days and kind of felt the solemnity of the experience. And then we could get, we kind of got used to wanting to go back to more ordinary days because it was a little exhausting. But it just kind of shows like the celebration or the the ability to celebrate that we have in the liturgical year. Yeah, and there's something we want to point out, too. And we're, this is something we're actually going to bring up a little bit more as we go on, as we get in, wrapping up the uh, ordinary time. And we're getting into the season of Advent, and we want to talk about living the season. This is part of living the life of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then what, what that prepares us to do in Christmas. And it's kind, of the, if we, it's kind of the opposite of the way a lot of people are used to doing it, right? Mm -hmm. How do we live Christmas? 
most people live Christmas before it starts, right? As soon as those Halloween de decorations are taken down, right? It's just one up and shit, getting that house ready. But you know, the thing is, think about what Advent is, time of expectation and hope, and also of peace, serenity, right? Preparing our souls to receive Christ, right? But what is preparing for Christmas oftentimes? What is it, right? It's often a time of of rambling, getting things together, preparing the house, cooking meals, preparing to, preparing to take trips, um, decorations, getting things ready, a time of, it can be a time of anxiety and frustration just because of all the things we have to do and, and the shopping and, and, the tra and the traveling to the shopping malls with all the crowds. And uh, it goes, and then, and then Christmas comes, and that was our celebration of Christmas. Christmas Day, take down the tree, get everything out of here, let's just calm it, and uh, Christmas is over. Just the opposite of the way we, the, the church celebrates Christmas, right? We slowly and gradually, peacefully, yeah, there's preparations, right? And there's, but there's a slow building, right? We, we put our manger scene together one piece at a time, mm -hmm. right? We, we put one piece of straw in the manger every night, right? We light a candle uh, for a week. We light two candles the next week. We might put up our tree one week. The next week, put some lights on it. The next week, get the fan together, start putting some decorations on it. Slow, gradual buildup. Hope, watching it grow, right? And then remembering in these moments that yes, there's moments of work, and there's moments of toil, and there's moments of you know having to deal with things, but maintaining that peace in our hearts, right? And looking at the season and seeing how really what everybody is doing is preparing for the coming of Jesus, right? In one way or another, that we're all building up to the celebration, but there's this prayer for hope during this time. And then when Christmas comes, right, okay? That we that we that when, for mo for many people when Christmas is over for us, it's just begun, right? And it's an eight day party. See, Catholics, we are party people. <laughs> we do it for eight days, eight days of, of, a, of a Christmas octave where we celebrate, right? And then we get into the next. We go back into uh, well, there's a Christmas season is actually much longer than eight days. Uh, it's four weeks, but it's uh, you know, and that and that's the idea. Participating in this life of the church, and we're speaking about it in two different ways, right? One in terms of you know the devotion to the saints and where they fit into the liturgical calendar. And I haven't spoken about mine yet, St. James, but maybe we'll we'll get around to that. And, that, and, that, and see, that's that's the whole idea here. I'm gonna I am gonna I am gonna pause on that for a minute. I mean, there's patron saints for people and places and things, and there's patron saints for nations, right? Mm -hmm. And St. James is the patron of, patron of Spain. Mm -hmm. So when it's St. James Feast Day, we have sangria and paella, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a big... So we, you know, you, you, uh, for, 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 for myself, right? To, to, so it's really identified with this person, but we also, we also celebrate. Right? In a special way. Right? If, you were to, if you were in Spain on the Feast of St. James, it would be like Christmas. Right? It would be um, a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. um, Allison, do you want to continue? You had some pictures over there. I did, did over there. So talk about celebrating St. James within those contexts here. In November, which will be a time of Advent, um, this image right here is an image of St. Cecilia, which is the, the convent that I was a part of, of the sisters. And... Um, I also, as an artist, love to have images of it, kind of like around the house. I have lots of pictures of my husband, my nieces, and nephews. And it's not worshiping the saints. What we're doing is we're actually just recalling their life to basically help us see an example and a model of holiness, of being lived out. So St. Tissa, this is actually the window that was in the, the, the chapel convent that was there. And during the middle of the night in a storm, what happened was, Part of her neck was blown out, and they had to redo it, but it actually goes along with her life. So in here, anyone know what she's a patron saint of? It's music. You can see here she has this like, musical instrument here. She was a young woman who was, who was Christian, um, and what she ended up doing was, um, I'm going to pull it out so you guys can see it better. She ended up, um, she promised, she vowed her life to virginity, but her parents forced her to get married to this man named Valerian, who was, who was not Christian. And on their wedding night, she knelt down before the bed and convinced him and also helped him to convert to Christianity. And so the next, like, I don't know if it was, I think it was the next day, the Romans came in to basically try to kill her, and they took him instead because he had become Christian, and they ended up executing him. Well, they came after her afterwards, and um, in the Roman times, you were allowed three slashes to the neck to, before, before the, the, they just would let you just die, and she had those three slashes. And she lay dying for three days. And um, so that neck being missed, the missing piece was kind of interesting how that all kind of fit in also to her story. 
And while she, she died, she had, her fingers were, um, she had two and then one. What do you think the one represented? She was basically died in a position where she had one finger out and then two fingers like this. One God and two natures, because that was something that was being contested at the time. The two natures of Christ. Two natures of Christ was God, God and man. man. And in, um, she was basically taken off and buried in the catacombs, and people would go pray for her. Catacombs were buried down when it was became illegal to pray um, or to basically offer mass. So they would go down there to celebrate mass. Um, and what happened was in 1599, they were, uh, they were basically going and excavating the catacombs, and they found her body incorrupt. So they had the Pope at the time had a statue made of her, and here's actually an image of the statue. It's St. Cecilia there. She's got the, the one finger and the, the, the two, two natures there laying down as she looked when they, when they basically excavated the catacombs. So he did this marble sculpture of her. And what I wanted to do in this particular piece that I came up with was to kind of talk about how we give our life, how do we unite our lives to Christ. And in their vocation, the sisters who are like St. Cecilia, they lie, lay their life down in their, the blood of their vows. So this is basically one of the sisters one of my good friend's sisters, Sister Mary Sheila, who is named after St. Cecilia, she wrote her vows to me, and then I ended up making them into a silk screen, and I ended up printing it onto this silk, this silk that's kind of transparent. So they, through their, life, through, their, through their vows, lay down their life to Christ and unite themselves to their beloved. And here's an image of Christ on the top. So it's kind of like she's looking up at him, he's looking down at her, recognizing that love relationship between the two. And she has always been a model for me of how I want to live not only in my life when I was discerning religious life, but also my married life. You know, my vows are kind of written in blood, and I laid down my life to, to a certain sense, not I live, but to, um, to live with so that we can be united to Christ through our relationship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just, uh, just commenting on this, we spoke about icons last mm -hmm. week, and this is not your traditional icon, maybe like a Greek Orthodox icon, but it is a uh, icon in the larger sense of the word. Now, what is an icon? An icon is an image. Right? And remembering that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And when we look to an image of a person, right, um, what we're seeing also is someone made in the image and likeness of God. And in the case of a saint, someone, when we're looking at the life of a saint, we're looking at the life of an imitator of Christ. Right? We are all called, we are all icons made in the image and likeness of God. And we are all called to be icons. Right? Images of God to others in our life, in our witness. So, and this is how I think she's done beautifully on this by layering with different uh, silk screens um, that this, this saint, through her life, through her commitment to Christ, we look through her, that she's like a window. We look through this person into, the, uh, into Christ, looking through her soul into Christ. It's kind of an interpretive on that piece there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really what, yes, go ahead. Can you explain the incorrupt a little bit more and why okay. God allows that or does that? Um, so incorrupt, basically, I mean, it's, it's, it's a miracle. Um, what happens is her body was completely preserved. She looked as if she had just died. And she died back in Roman times. In Roman times, so 300, it was like three, mm -hmm. 350s. Um, with, that, yeah. Just a little bit earlier. A little now. Okay, so, um, so maybe she, she, in that particular time, so God sometimes does things supernaturally, above nature, above, above nature. And so by allowing her body to be incorrupt, it shows his favor towards her. And what was beautiful was that, you know, in what we believe is the resurrection of the body, we believe that we will all rise again. And we will all, in some, some unique way, be united back to our bodies, which is what, Christ, what happened to Christ at the resurrection. So in some unique ways, um, her, God is kind of showing us and pointing us like an arrow to heaven through the way her body was incorrupt. And it's a miracle. Ultimately, yeah. we don't understand when you see something that defies science and medicine, we just, uh, the medical community would just basically say, we don't understand that, talk to your priest. Um, in other words, it's a miracle, right? Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more later on, and we want to put things in the right order, but about where it's going to fit in with uh, the part about the communion of the saints, about the resurrection of the body. Because I'm sure there's some questions that we're going to have about that, so we'll talk about that. And also, if you have any questions at any time, or at the end, we'll have time for that. Allison, what do you got? This one here, oh, excuse me, is of Mother Teresa, who is just... Ken and I was just a while back. She's actually a woman who had a great influence on my life. And as you said, Dick, these saints are basically like arrows to heaven. You know, they're, we don't worship them. What we do is we, we basically look to them as our models and examples to give us a model for how to live a holy life. And if anyone ever saw her in action, um, it is a very humbling experience. She was such a woman of God, such a woman of prayer. And um, I remember one, one quote that I have from Mother Teresa was just this, um, quote that I work over and over again in my mind is that we are only as miserable as we are selfish. 
And that's just a beautiful quote to think about. We're only as miserable as our selfish because she lives a selfless life. And we now know from her writings that she also went through great trials. And you wouldn't be able to know that from her experience, from, from, from seeing her. I mean, we know it was hard, but she was always so joyful. People said she radiated light. And even her own darkness, she was given that grace to be able to be light to others. And so she's a model, an example of our contemporary times of someone who is living and walking the life of Christ in their own unique way and giving us hope that we can do this. You know, we're, we, and we have our cloud of witnesses, our other fellow brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ, who are up there in heaven praying for us and helping us along the path. And so she's another person that I, I really look to for, for prayer and support. And um, in our new house, we, ended up, um, we decided to dedicate a prayer room. So we have a room that we, we have all of our kind of spiritual things in to be able to go there and pray. And this piece here, anyone want to recognize where it's from? St. Peter's. St. Peter's, okay. So, talking about the cloud of many witnesses, there's a cloud behind there. And then there's what's on the top of each of the statues. Well, who, who are the statues, do you think? Saints. All the saints. So, the colonnades in, in Rome are basically that when you go into St. Peter's, it's kind of de de designed to be like open arms. The universality of the church is like an open arms, like a mother receiving her children. That's kind of the, the, the idea. And we're not only, we're surrounded by her, that home team advantage, when we walk in there, it's like, when we get to heaven, they're all going to be cheering us on. And right now they're cheering us on. But the aspect of us being surrounded by all these heavenly saints is just like, it's heightening our sensitivity to the reality of the world. We may not see them, but they're there. And they're, they're there because they're their older brothers and sisters. And because God is a good father, he wants us to all be part of this big family and not just be isolated ourselves. And that's the gift of being in St. Peter's. Um, I was there for uh, the Pallium Mass. This is when the bishops received, uh, they, take a, they have a lamb that makes their um, stole, it's not like a stole, the Pallium, mm -hmm. there. But just being surrounded by that, I just was so taken aback by that. And my first experience of having had that um, experience of being part of something so much bigger than myself was at World Youth Day. And I was sharing a little bit earlier, John Paul II instituted World Youth Days, which are basically when you get youth together. And he was, it was in Denver, and it was in the summertime. And I remember walking on this pilgrimage at World Youth Day. And um, first of all, they told John, John Paul II that nobody would come, and millions of people came. <laughs> it was just kind of like, it was a renewal of the Catholic Church, I think, in th this contemporary time, being part of the John Paul II generation. And I remember walking this 19 miles in the excruciating heat to get to Cherry Creek National Park. And... Um, as I was walking and praying, there were people who were from Croatia, people from Zimbabwe, people from Ireland, all walking with me along this path for 19 miles. <laughs> and we had to encourage each other on to be able to finish this walk because there was no food until we got there. <laughs> and even when we got there, it was, it was just like this huge gathering of all these million of my closest friends who I hadn't met before. <laughs> it was just a huge experience. And I think that we had somebody else who went to World Youth Day there. You, you were there as well. And it was just and I, it was just this amazing experience of feeling we were part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And that was really the beginning, I think, of my conversion of making my, my faith my own, was being part and really being able to see for the first time how we're not alone. We are in this with all these brothers and sisters that are in the, on the earth, but also in heaven. That's the beauty of our faith, is that God doesn't, it's not just between me and God, it is between me and God, and my relationship with Christ, but Christ be, and, and God the Father invites us to have brothers and sisters to pray for each other, because we're part of a family. And our older brothers, other brothers and sisters in faith, they are the ones who've done it. They run the race, and they won. And they're here to encourage us. And the liturgical year is kind of living that out with the life breath of, of, of our faith. Mm -hmm. Um, I will share like some practical experiences. If you guys want to open up, your, use your cell phones. We can be international here today. We can interact. Um, there is there is a website that is one of my friends' website, and she goes through the liturgical year how to live it in her family life. So she gives practical examples of how to live this out. So if you want to Google search um, right now, it's called um, a, a slice of Smith life, and then it's a, it basically a slice of Smith life. And, and then after that, I put liturgical, um, liturgical life. So, and hopefully it should come up. A slice of liturgical life, or a slice, her last name is Smith. Um, the part, it's a slice of liturgical life. Did it come, did it get it? Yep, a slice of Smith life and then our liturgical life right there. And kind of pull it up and it basically gives, um, everyone kind of get there? 
you know? Or, or type in a, slight, a, a slice of liturgical life. It wouldn't get... And in there, there's a, um, on her first page, does anyone kind of get it? It looks kind of like this. On there, she begins to say, this page is dedicated to a liturgical Catholic calendar in various seasons, Advent, Christmas, Easter, Lent, and feast days of our family has celebrated in the past. Similar to our traditional calendar that marks with four seasons, 12 months, 365 days, holy celebrations, the liturgical years also mark the special seasons and feast days. This, uh, this page is a summary of the seasons and feast days that our family has celebrated since I started blogging in June 2010. It's an ongoing work in progress. And I love this quote about um, the difference between the 12-month calendar and the liturgical calendar. Um, it says here, The purpose of the liturgical calendar is not to mark the passage of time, but to celebrate the understand more fully the entire mystery of Jesus Christ, from his incarnation and birth until his ascension, the day of Pentecost, and the ex um, and expectation of his return in glory. During the course of the year, the Paschal mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus is viewed from different angles in different lights. And so here she has an example of how they practice the liturgical season of Advent. You kind of scroll down. It talks about what they do with the Advent wreath and things like that and different amped fonts, things you can have. Then as you continue to scroll down, it shows how they can celebrate Christmas with different practical ideas of living that out. Um, just kind of scrolling through. This is a great resource for living this in your, in your family life or in your single life. I mean, I, I use some of her examples to be able to invite people over. We made Advent wreaths when I was single. And we had an Advent wreath party. And it was really fun. And then we also had celebrations um, uh, in the Easter Triduum. You see kind of different examples of what she does and also different recipes um, to be able to do. It's just a great resource here. And also special feast days. She has special feast days on here and how you can celebrate each of these liturgical days. <coughs> in unique ways to help live that Catholic life of the, of the church because it's really, you're part of this family <laughs> and it's, it's part of the celebrations of, of living in the life of the faith. Okay. So as far as example, I highly recommend looking at that. There's also other blogs about living liturgical life, but it's a great way to kind of make it real, make it practical. Great. So at this point, what I'd like to do is we're gonna, I'm gonna go into some of the explanation of uh, taking some of the things that she said and then spelling it out in practical ways the mystery of the church and our participation uh, in, in, in the church as part of the communion of saints. Um, but at this point, before we, since we're going we're gonna to go on until uh, 10.30, so we are going to take a little break. It's a good thing to do in between a long <coughs> lecture. But I just want to ask before we do that, do we have any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, when you were talking about St. Cecilia, mm -hmm. you said at Roman times, right? Yes. Is that when the Bible was being written or... Well... It, well, I mean, it, well, it was being canonized, not written. Okay, so like, you just like obviously she's not mentioned in the Bible. Oh, but, oh no, no, oh, no, no. no. Yes, I mean, yeah. there's not very many women who are, but because mm -hmm. it was that time, but you know, other than Esther, but this would have been third, the the third, century. Second, third century, and the Bible was was completed uh, by the end of the first century, as far as the New Testament goes. Now, the Old mm -hmm. Testament had been completed much earlier. Right. Right. So yeah, she's these saints are. Let's just we, what we call saints are um, is Moses. Is Moses a saint? Some people say. I mean, some, sometimes you'll hear Saint Moses or Saint Abraham. Uh, but saints are those who have died, who've lived holy lives after the death of Christ, as witnesses to Jesus Christ. And then there, are, of course, there are holy men and women who live before Jesus Christ, um, who we are, who are also uh, in heaven with him. Right. Does that kind of point? What we were... Yeah, I just didn't okay. know. I mean, I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation about Mary Magdalene. Oh, uh, yes. Now, she, of course, is in the Bible. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, it, what, you know, she's a prostitute or whatever, but there's other historical um, authors. I mean, obviously, they take fictional liberties because there's not much writ written. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like that she, for her to um, be a follower of hers, I'm sure she was considered like, oh, that was like you just didn't hang out with women or women didn't go hang out with, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't, I don't know if, like, some of these, when they, you know, the saints, it was women, um, you know, how they're um, like, <laughs> considered. And, well, but, honestly, if, if we're talking, like, going back to Father Patrick's talk at the beginning, there were women who followed Christ, and they were once, if you look at the foot of the cross, who's there? You're right. women. All women. <laughs> and, and the beloved disciple, who was John. But everybody else left. So women have always been part of his following, and there was a, a, actually um, kind of a cult of virginity that happened afterwards, and the cult of being people who wanted to give their life totally as Christ did. He came as a pure, right. chaste individual. And so by 
um, by the early century, early, early time of Christianity, women decided to give their lives to Christ in that particular way. And we have historical examples of that that aren't in the scriptures because of, you know, it was during the time, time that, or after the scriptures were put together. Um, but um, St. Cecilia was one of those women who was dedicating her life to Christ and wanted to in a very unique way. And a lot of them in those early years, mm -hmm. uh, up until about uh, 300 uh, AD, were, were martyrs yeah. for, for living their faith. And in the, um, you probably have heard in the Catholic Church where you see um, the liturgical prayers, or the, um, there's one where they have Linus, Clinus, Clement, Cornelius, when you pray for these, and they also have Agatha, Lucy, Cecilia, so they're, they're in the martyrs of the canon, and also as a perpetual and felicity, which one was perpetual and felicity, one of them was a mother who actually had her child, gave her child to someone else to entrust them because she was going to um, be, be murdered, mind, yeah. and she was willing to lay her life down at that particular stage. So this is the time of this is the time of the Romans kind of persecution in there. Mm -hmm. So there are many examples of, of women saints during that time frame as well. So I don't know, does that answer your question at all or Yeah, I think so. I mean I just you know, you just don't read a lot about mm -hmm. some of this stuff in the Bible. Yeah, it's definitely not in the yeah. Bible. It happened happened much later. Much later. Um, we do have, like Rob was pointing out, there are a lot of books and resources on lives of the saints and who they were. And again, it's not it's I want to tie it back in with this reading today, right, with the, with the Pharisee, right? Well, the Pharisee was all about me, okay? With the saints, with these people, it's about all about him, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that they, have, that, that they have recognized and accepted who they are as sinners. Mm -hmm. They have accepted and embraced God's mercy, and now they live lives of joy. Mm -hmm. And that's a requirement for being a saint. There are no dismal saints, right? There are people who may have suffered, people who have, may, may have gone through their trials. St. Paul went through incredible trials, um, and, and many other saints did. Um, St. John Paul II is an excellent example. Of, and near the end of his life, he lived a rich, long life and, and was robust. But and near the end, he got Parkinson's, his health started going downhill. And he was, and he, you could tell the man was seriously suffering. And he did not shy away from the camera. He did not hide away. He did not give up. Right? He came out and boldly wanted to give that witness of suffering with joy and the dignity of, of human life and, and the dignity of old age. He was setting himself, putting himself out as an example uh, of, of suffering, but always with de, united to Jesus Christ and with, with great joy, right? And uh, that's that's where we that's what that, that's the reason why we look to these these people. It's not and their joy is not in themselves. Their joy is because they're united to Christ. Right? So that, that again, just kind of reiterating a point. Why? What is the, the point of the devotion to the saints in the Catholic Church? Devotion to the saints can can be ultimately summed up in a simple line, and that is um, imitating their virtues. Because if you're, like St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Right? We look to our older brothers right, who give us a good example, brothers and sisters, right? and they, they, they lead us through virtue to also do the same thing, showing us the way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, if you're interested, just kind of, um, if you look in the liturgical calendar, uh, if you switch to the next page, there are some, if you have any questions about where scripture has examples of saints or praying to the saints, there is a whole section on, it's basically a copy of this, um, and it's like this, um, on there, you find that, this is a resource on how to use it, you can find on there where it says like, uh, praying intercession of the saints is on the back page, it's on the last column all the way over, communion of saints. There's a bunch of scripture passages that talk about the communion of saints. Um, and then underneath there is intercession, intercessory prayer to saints. And examples in the scriptures of where people ha had intercession with other people who were in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so cause I know it's something perhaps that does differentiate us from, from Protestant understanding of, of, of life. Mm -hmm. Is that oftentimes they're like, do you pray, you pray to saints? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because in the Catholic Church, what, you know, what is prayer? Prayer is communication. Do we talk? Do we, we ask them to pray for us and intercede, but we never see them as God. And we all, we always ask for them to pray for us, um, and that's that's kind of a, a different understanding of. Understanding yeah, they're different that. types. Exactly, exactly. they're different types of prayer too. I mean, mm -hmm. there's adoration, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then there is there's supplication, right? There's uh, there can be devotion, right? There can just be dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. I spoke about it uh, when we brought up that icon last uh, last week, and uh, we're just pointing out. That um, when we like we pray, we can pray in many ways. And we're never going to have a class where we just tell you this is how you pray, right? Uh, the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, and He gave them some some pointers, gave them the Our Father. But ultimately, it's a dialogue with God, and there th there are aids, right? Things that help us out. 
right? Prayer groups, right? Or books, or just the Bible. What we do here in breaking open of the Word can be taken can be taken home into our own rooms, right, with our spouses or by ourselves, and 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 prayed. And then another way of doing that is with 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 religious art, right? And because what it ultimately is is something that brings us in communion with God, right? And we dialogue with these people. Like we bring out the. Um, I was going to talk about that one over there, okay. the, the Madonna <laughs> by Raphael, right, well, the gold, yeah, the goldfinch, I believe. And also, Mary does have a primacy in certain of, of the saints. So I'm going to have to cut this after this, if you don't mind. But I'll just hold this. Okay, and and, and here's what it, here's what I'm talking about: praying with art. You don't pray to the art, right? I mean, it's a block of wood with some with two dimensional design on it. Okay. Um, but when we look at this thing, just take a moment, contemplate, contemplating everything about it, or anything about it, right? The colors, okay? the lines, the directionality, the background, right? Just kind of focus the mind in them. There might be one thing in this, in this picture that speaks to us, the hand, right? And then we can enter into dialogue with the people in the picture, okay? And it's not like we're talking to the picture, but we're talking, we're in, we're in prayer, right? We're spiritual beings, and we can commune, right, with the saints, and, and, Mary, and we are in communion with the saints. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but can we, then we begin to get into a, enter into a dialogue and see how Mary has tender love for Jesus. Right? And then you can actually talk to Mary. Mary, tell me about your tender love for Jesus. Right? And the image is an occasion right, that helps us enter into this dialogue. And for those of us who are more visual right, or more, have more artistic uh, uh, the art sensitivity, there can be many ways in which art or any image or something like that can help us to pray. But here's the, here's the thing, is what it all comes down to, it helps us in as much as it helps us to unite ourselves to Christ. Right? And that's really the point of everything that we're talking about. And now we want to talk after this uh, five minute break, we'll take five, about the communion of saints and how we participate in that. Thanks. Mm -hmm.